When I plan out my instructional time, I use the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of my students' time is spent with the teacher given that explicit instruction. The rest of that 80%, well, that's an opportunity for them to continue to practice those skills, either independently or with a partner. In this video, guys, I'm gonna be sharing with you how I manage that 80% time. First, I would like to thank Lakeshore for sponsoring this video. Guys, I am really excited to announce that I will be partnering with Lakeshore this year. I've always been a huge fan of all of their products for both ELA and for math, and now I'm excited to be able to have this opportunity to share their products with all of you. So if you are a follower of Michelle with Pocketful of Primary, you may have seen some of these items that I'm gonna be sharing in this video on her channel, but I'm going to approach it from a very different lens. One of the very first goal work bins that I like to set up at the beginning of the year is my multiplication facts. So Lakeshore has this wonderful math facts folder game library set, which allows for you to scaffold the multiplication facts. Uh, I know for a fact that I have students who they have certain ones mastered. They have certain multiplication facts mastered, whether it be twos or threes or ones, or they have their tens, but it's always kind of those tricky ones, those seven, eights, nines. Lakeshore allows for me to be be able to scaffold that learning for them and make it very specific and targeted for how are they going to practice their math facts. I keep these up all year round because let's be honest, the more that my kids have that opportunity to practice these games, the more they're going to retain that information. And if you had the opportunity to watch last week's video on the Q&A for the Mac team, I will say that this goes back to power standards and my goal work relates uh, very heavy on those power standards. So what I end up doing is if I have certain standards that I feel like my students need to have extra practice on, I will put some of those activities inside of these folders. Uh, and then I have some of those activities that are not power standards, but I want to have plenty of opportunities for my students to be able to practice these games or these skills individually. So that's where my goal work also comes into play because they can constantly come back to these skills over and over again all year long. The second way that I like to ensure that my students are getting plenty of opportunity with practicing previous skills is by sending home my goal work games with parents. Now, please don't confuse this with homework because this is totally separate. This is in those rare occasions or maybe those frequent occasions where you have parents that are sending you asking for additional resources to practice with their kids at home. Uh, maybe it's the fact that paper and pencil really frustrates a child. Uh, I've had a couple of students this year that if I send home a paper and pencil, they'll sit down and then we'll work on something for about a good 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And that's just not the kind of practice that I think is effective for students. But in those occasions where you feel like they just need to have some additional practice and you want to send home something that's engaging, that's exciting, that could also get the entire family involved, I like to use Lakeshore's Sort and Store book totes. Y'all, these book totes are absolutely fantastic to the point where I certainly wish that I had these back when I was in kindergarten. These are so wonderfully made. They are durable. They are, you could just tell that the quality is really high quality and they are gonna last you for years and years. But what I like to do is I like to send home any type of goal work or activities inside of these totes, mainly because it's gonna protect the things that I've purchased. <laughs> so I don't typically just like to send them home and say, hey, good luck, and I'm just gonna put it inside of a Ziploc bag because I know for fact that it's going to come back with pieces missing or it's going to have some sort of a stain on it or it's probably going to have crumbs from something that was inside of that child's backpack. Anything that I put inside of this is going to keep it nice, neatly organized. I typically will also put in some sort of a uh, like materials sheet that allows parents to be able to check off, hey, here are the materials that should be inside of this tote when you return it to me. Uh, but it's gonna prevent any type of spillage from happening inside of the backpacks. And it just gives us that extra feeling of, oh, this is super fun. Like how cool would it be that if your child came home with one of these and said, mom, we need to play this game. I am really stoked because it came in this super cool tote you know that they get excited about these cool totes. So I like to send home any type of these activities. 
I will also say, and I'm going to throw in a little kindergarten piece in here because it was just probably the highlight of my entire year, uh, but I would make class books with my students in kindergarten. And so every time that I would make a class book in kindergarten, I wanted to send it with parents for the kids to be able to read them with their families. Uh, they always enjoyed kind of looking at what their peers were writing. They also got to share what they put inside of that book. So what I would do is if I only had one of these really nice totes, I would send it in this, but but I would put a nice little letter and then I would put the uh, book, the class book that I had in here. Now I usually had a good two or three of these in rotation. So I would send it home one night, the children would read it with their parents that night, they would bring it back and then I would give it to the next child. And so we would just rotate these and kids would just be so excited to be able to bring these home and share them with their families. So fantastic quality and it's just another way for you to continue that practice by sending home things that you know that the kids are going to enjoy and want to share with their families. The third way that I like to utilize that 80% practice time is by incorporating friction-free teaching. Now stick with me for just a moment. Friction-free teaching is this idea that we don't have to necessarily teach every single piece of information to our students. I like to use definitions as my example for friction-free teaching because when we think about definitions, uh, if you're spending your time as a teacher teaching the definitions to your students, you are truly wasting your time. Uh, your time could be best used uh, going out and really facilitating other students' learning, helping students really work through skills that are much more difficult than what a definition is. Nowadays, we have technology at our fingertips tips. Students have the ability to be able to go online and look up definitions, or you can have them work in partners and have them kind of say, who can find the definition? I want you to go to two different sources, and then I want you to compare them. Uh, or if you have a video, um, I use Schoology as kind of our database for being able to kind of throw all of our uh, assignments inside of. Uh, and if you have something like that, it's kind of like a Blackboard. If you guys have heard of Blackboard or use this in school for yourselves, uh, Schoology allows me to be able to put up a video myself and that allows me to be able to kind of teach it without truly teaching the definition. Uh, so I incorporate a lot of friction-free teaching and I like to think of those units, especially in math, that really don't have those prerequisites. Uh, uh, so these are units that can be taught in isolation uh, and have a lot of those skills that are pretty lower level. It's just understanding and being able to identify them uh, and being able to kind of read the information from them. And one of those units or a couple of those units actually is going to be uh, my geometry, my measurement and my algebra unit. And so geometry and measurement are ones that I will allow my students to be able to use games to practice those skills. And Lakeshore has a great game. It's the geometric measurement game. Um, and it's just a grab and play game that my students absolutely love. They practice perimeter, they practice angles, they practice area, all of the skills that I need for them to be able to learn that with through, through this game, they have the ability to practice with a partner so that they can kind of perfect those skills and work through, through the curriculum at their own pace. My boys inside of my class are absolutely competitive. They always push each other to really kind of finish units as quickly as they can. They always want to receive the best score, the highest score. So these games are absolutely perfect for them because they are so competitive and they do push themselves to really be the best and learn as much information as possible. Possible. So they love this idea and this idea of friction-free teaching also allows for me to free up my time to be able to work with those students who need me the most. So in keeping along the same lines of friction-free teaching, another really great way to have your students practice those previous skills is by allowing them to create their own games. So just recently, I brought in the Lakeshore Giant Equation Dice, and I had a few boys that were working on some algebra, and they decided that they wanted to create an algebra problem or a game to be able to play with a partner. The objective of their game was to roll an equation so you would select two green, two blue, and three red die, and you would roll it and create some sort of an equation problem. Now, if you rolled an equal sign or a greater than or less than sign, then you would simply just re-roll those until you got the, a 
proper operation to be able to use for the game. You would write out your equation problem and then swap papers with your partner, have them solve it, and then you would submit your work at the very end. So this was just a game that they ended up coming up with and creating. They thought it was fun and it was an engaging way and they liked to see the combinations of how they could create their own algebra problems. So now that their game is completely made, we also decided to take it a step further and make it into a go work folder. So now all of my students in my classroom, when they've gotten to that point where they're ready to practice those algebra skills, they can take out the game that my students have created and practice it with another partner. So that is it guys. I hope you were able to take away some really great strategies or skills that you can easily implement into your own classrooms to extend that 80% practice time. That is a lot of time to be able to practice, but with having a variety of different ways for students to be able to practice those skills, it will keep them engaged and then it will also continue their higher level thinking. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. I would love for you to support the channel by giving the video a thumbs up up and I will see you all next time. Hey y'all, if you found any of these items interesting, be sure to check the description box down below for all of the links. Also, don't forget to use the code 3115 to get 25% off any single non-sale item. Y'all, that's 25% off using the code 3115. Thanks for watching. Bye!